Dink, 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 dink. Welcome back to the Gingerling Podcast, last episode of the year. I can't believe it. I can't believe it. The next time you see us, it'll be 2020. 2020. 2020, y'all. This episode is brought to you by Calm. Everybody just take a second throughout your day to calm down with Calm, the app. It is an incredible app that promotes mindfulness and helps sleep right now. You can get 40% off of a Calm Premium subscription at calm, C-A-L-M dot com slash Jenna Julian. That's 40% off, un- unlimited access to their entire library. It's a great app. I use it all the time. Can't recommend it enough. Also, guys, the skim helps you get in the know every single day with a nice, tidy newsletter of all the top news stories right to your email inbox completely free, Okay. 7 million people currently use it. You should too. Go to the skim, T H E S K I M M dot com slash Anna Julian. Enter your email, subscribe completely free, and you're in. And you're also, also entered to win a $250 Visa gift card when you do that. Thank you, sponsors. Thank you, sponsors. Come on. Come on. <laughs> she wants to sit with Come you. On. All on, the man. doggos want to be up here this week. They want. It's the grand finale of 2019. Oh, don't say that. That's too much pressure. Grand finale. Oh, I would have planned something better if I thought of it that way. Well, Game of Thrones didn't, so... What? I said Game of Thrones didn't. Wow. But there, that that's was not some, a grand finale. That's like some really cold tea you just spilled. <laughs> <laughs> what? That, I'm just... My point is that a grand finale doesn't have to be good. It's just the last one. Oh, I see. Okay, yeah, for it's, sure. It's just the finale. Got it. Yeah. This is the finale. <laughs> season whatever finale Fuck we'll be back everything. next season <laughs> wow uh yeah for real so this is this podcast is the last one of the year then we're taking two weeks off we're very taking excited. time off for our minds very excited. and our well-being and then we'll be back uh january 6th i think is the next podcast so you'll have to do without listening to us talk i don't know how you're gonna do that it's pretty I much air <laughs> <laughs> wow also, I think I uh, straightened out the frame. I think we were a little off-centered. Now we're not. The end. By Doolin. Good one. Jenna has a new thing. We actually have two new things we're going to do this episode. It's pretty fun. Well, yeah, because I mean, I just do it all the time anyways, <laughs> as it is. So I was like, I don't know. Maybe Might as well make content, baby. <laughs> someone's interested in all of the things that I wikipedia this week. <laughs> I have a problem. Like, I've seen other people tweet it, too. Like, this isn't what this list is. But, like, if I'm watching a show or, like, a movie or anything like that and there's an actor or something, I'm like, who's that? I go into Wikipedia, everything about them, like, everything that's ever happened in their life. Why is that? I don't know. I'm just, like, a curious person. Is that is curiosity? Yeah. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I, like, I mean, I get that. I just want to know more about people. A lot of times it's people and then sometimes or... I guess more often than I realize, it's just like random stuff. Well, you got to take it with a grain of sea salt, right? Because it might be just edited poorly and wrong. What? Wikipedia? It's not 100% right. Oh, yeah. No, whatever. I take I it just, with a grain of sea salt. I like information. Yeah, Himalayan sea salt. Take it with a grain of it. Do you ever just Wikipedia stuff, Joe? Sometimes, yeah. I mean, I, I don't really... I don't so much wikipedia stuff as i just like google it and then i'm like kind of wherever i feel like i don't really end up on wikipedia a ton i either end up on like uh like imdb i go to a lot because i'm really interested in like filmography because if i see someone i'm like where are they from yeah you do that so much if if you like the way something is edited or something like that you'll go and you'll look up that person yeah like look at what other stuff they've done yeah but then other things where i'm like that guy is such a familiar face i need to know what he was in or something like that what like Cher? Yeah. She was in Moonstruck. Dude, have we talked about that? We watched Moonstruck? We watched Moonstruck. Moonstruck, dude. Such a, like, such Thank a good movie. Thank you guys movie. for all of your suggestions. I mean, we were going to watch it anyway since we're on a quest to watch every Nicolas Cage movie of all time. All time. And it came highly, highly recommended from all of y'all. We watched over Thanksgiving with my mom and it was such a good time. It was so time. good. It was like, honestly, a fucking genuinely amazing movie. We and I, it. it's like... One of my favorite movies now. I was like crying laughing at the end. It was so good. I was in tears. It was so good. And Nicolas Cage was so good in it. And so yeah. was Cher. Like we we like talk about how how goofy he is in his later stuff, especially all the bad movies he's done. But like 
this was a re- he did really good in this movie, and it was just such a beautiful movie. I don't know. It really was, and I really liked that the movie wasn't about him. Yeah, it wasn't. It was about, about him. Cher. It was about Cher. It was about Cher. Yeah, I loved it. But all the, the family members, every supporting actor, actor, actress was like ten out of fucking 10. good, man. Ten out of ten. Yeah, special Wouldn't movie. Recommend. If you haven't watched Moonstruck, we're we're passing on that recommendation because it is good. And I, we watched it with my mother. So if you're with your family and such a great family you guys movie. are looking for, I, would, I wouldn't call it a family movie. Well, you know, adult family movie. I mean, it's not even adult, but it's like, yeah, we watched it with your mom. Yeah. I mean, I, I wouldn't say it's a, you wouldn't want to watch it with like your little cousins and stuff, you know, or something yeah, kid, like if that. If you're a kid, you're going to be bored by the movie. Yeah. There's, Probably. There's some things in there that <laughs> might be a lot for a kid. Um, but yeah, no, we, it was a good time. We, I had a good time. Like, I think part of what made it, I mean, it was an incredible movie, but I had just, I don't even know what my expectations were. They were low, first of all, because I don't know. I just, I had low expectations. And also I just, it, like if for something about the movie, it was, it was just like really unlike any movie I had ever seen. So I think it's always cool when you see a, a film that like really just kind of like, I don't know, like bends what you think a movie can be in your mind a little bit. It was just so different. I don't know. I really liked it. I liked it. It felt like a play sometimes. Yeah, it did feel very much like a play. Uh, anyway, I don't know how we got there, but how did we get there? I don't know. Oh, the IMDb thing and looking up mm-hmm. movies and stuff, yeah. Did you look up the director of that movie? No, but do you know? remember how excited I got when I we were watching Silicon Valley? And one single frame. This is what Julian does. One single frame this is what Julian does. was uncolored. And you had I had to like pause and go into like quarter frame by frame to see it but there was one single frame that the colorist didn't color and it was left in like flat s log and it looked wrong but it was so quick i was so excited that i caught that oh my god he loves that stuff and then i have to sit there for 20 minutes while you try and catch the frame and miss it like a hundred times and then we're watching like survivor they have really great b-roll and time lapses so when there's a good time lapse i'll just be like D slaps, D slaps. That's what he says during every show. If there's ever a time lapse, D slaps, D slaps. <laughs> and then when we were watching Moonstruck, and there were those aerial shots. And, oh no, it wasn't Moonstruck. We were watching Jingle All the Way, and there were aerial God, shots. God, what a t- oh! Don't hold on, even- hold on. Let me finish this point, and then we'll get there. We were watching Jingle All the Way, and it was made a long time ago, and there were aerial shots, and I was like, yeah, they fucking had to have a helicopter shoot that thing. <laughs> Um, and just like pointing out things like that is what I did. But yeah, mo- um, Jingle All the Way, uh, I watched it when I was a child a lot, like during the holidays. So for me, growing up, I was like, oh, yeah, Jingle All the Way. It's a pastime of mine. I watched it during the holidays and it reminds me of the holidays as a child. How wonderful. Let's watch it. And we watched it right before Moonstruck. And holy fuck, it is bad. <laughs> it's so bad. And I like, I'm eating my words because I will stand by the fact that Stuck on You is amazing. Okay. Jingle All the Way. Jingle All the Way is oh a trash movie. Hold on. It is no. so not what I remember so it to we're be with, at all. We're, we're with my mom and we're watching it. Like it's opening up and my mom's like, what do you remember like liking about the movie? You know, because we're having a great time because it's fucking bad. We're just like laughing at it because it's just not, yeah. And I remember when the movie came out being like Arnold Schwarzenegger was a big, huge action star. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. And it was like a... Uh, his equivalent of Dwayne the Rock Johnson doing the Tooth Fairy mm-hmm. or whatever. It's yeah. like this action star that's doing this family movie yeah. and uh, it's like toys and kids and Christmas and Arnold Schwarzenegger. Mm-hmm. That's what I remember. Yeah. Like a, a fun toy action movie yeah. about Christmas. Love it. 10 out of 10. So we're all like in this mindset being like, okay, yeah, I'm sure it's going to be 90s and bad or whatever. But like, Cliche. Yeah. Oh, it is so fucking bad let me tell you the story of jingle all the way is be a shit dad do shit terrible fucking things to try and make up for the fact that you're a shit dad you have a perfect tornado of circumstances that allow you to redeem yourself from being a perfect like an absolute garbage dad and that's it also, the moral consumerism. Of the story is be a shit dad do shit things and then your kid will forget and then you. also consumerism 
all buy of toys. My life. There's literally a shot. He's like, <laughs> he's he wants to get this toy for his son because he mm. forgot, and Turbo it's like Man. the most in demand toy, so he can't get it anywhere. So that's the plot. He's mm. just going around doing awful things to get this toy that he forgot to get for yeah. his son. And he's like in a in a bar in the middle of the day drinking because he's like defeated that he can't get this toy. It's it's Christmas Eve and he's just drinking in a bar, a diner, not even a bar. Yeah, with this mailman that he runs into. And he looks over at the mailman, and for some reason he sees his son. And it, there's a a actual shot of his son who's supposed to be a child. He's a child. In the mailman's outfit, like drinking his day away. There's a shot of a child taking shots of whiskey out of a flask or something oh my god and he's like oh no i don't want my son to turn into that i gotta go get this toy he feeds it a reindeer alcohol and he also punches the same reindeer in the face (laughs) he like abuses that he lights his neighbor's house on fire (laughs) (laughs) they blow up a building with a bomb at one point and a bunch of cops they blow up a bunch of cops (laughs) But then the cops are like fine later. They just have like bandages on. <laughs> he tries to take that bouncy ball from a child and just goes, this is my ball from the top of a mall. And then at the end, he's just like, everything's redeemed because he's like this. He, well, spoiler fucking alert here. <laughs> he becomes Turbo Man. And at the parade, he acts out Turbo Man. He's, he mm-hmm. is him. And all of the horrible things that he's done to like drive his wife into the arms of another man and everything. She's just like. Oh, he's a superhero. He's so hot. I love him. <laughs> it's like, wait, he's what? He's so hot in that I thought costume. You were, yeah, like, weren't you just on the phone with him saying, I'm tired of listening to you, I'm done? Like, mm-hmm. pseudo breaking up or like separating? I don't know, but I I really like, so he goes through all the trouble, oh. the entire movie, to get this stupid toy for his son. Mm-hmm. And then his son gives it to uh, the, mailman the mailman's man. son gr- at the end, who's going to prison, by the way, because he no, he, blew, he, he gives it to the mailman. Yeah, the adult mailman. Yeah, for his son. So we think. Yeah, so he's like, I I want to give your son the toy yeah. because you know well, I already it, have Turbo Man. Turbo Man's my dad. Yeah. So the the son is like a better person than the dad the entire movie. The entire movie. And that's it. And then that's it. And then also during the finale, like in the parade. You see Arnold's character and he's just like, I could get used to this. Because he's like the center of attention and he's like this new superstar. He like doesn't give a fuck about the fact that his kid is like, A, lost in a crowd and now in danger because he's Mm -hmm. being part of the show. But like B, doesn't know where his fucking father is. And he's just like, yeah, I could get used to this. It's terrible. It's It's a terrible, It's like awful. Terrible movie. And then also something like a very small detail that everyone seemed to like glaze over, but... If you watch this movie, in the final scene where they're at the parade and they're fighting over this doll, which is Turbo Man doll, the doll is like 2.5 times bigger than the doll that he wants in, in from the stores. It's like, looks like an infant child, kind of. It's like a very big version. Like, I don't know how you'd even play with a doll that big. And that's the that's the good doll. When, when in the stores, they come in like doll size, like in a package, like mm. very small. It's like... That seems like kind of a big know. continuity error that they would just have the wrong size doll for the most important scene in the movie. No idea. Where do we go with this podcast? Sorry. Sorry. Anyway, jingle all the way. Don't watch it. But honestly, if you want to watch a bad movie with your family, that's a great bad movie to watch with your family. It's terrible. I just like there were some shocking moments when I he punches sh- the reindeer <laughs> and when the building blows up from the bomb. Yeah. That's shocking. Mm-hmm. I felt shocked. I felt shocked when there's a child drinking alcohol. (laughs) (laughs) I felt shocked when that guy, the neighbor, was just like very creepy. Ted? What was his name? Trying to steal his wife the entire movie. (sighs) So, ah! The whole thing is just so much. Okay. Anyways, you want to know some things? Yeah, give us some Wikipedia things. I want to hear what you've been wikiing. Okay, Wikiing. Sit with me, but. No, no, no. That's not a choice. Okay. I love you. For the last podcast, mm. you can sit with me, honey, but you oh gotta boy. sit. So this week, I've been watching a lot of Ancient Aliens again. I was yeah. uh, going back and... Stop it! Hey! Nothing. No, don't be sad already. I'm not being sad. I just, I was just going to say that I've been waking up in the middle of the night to it, so I know it's on. Da, na, 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 na. Okay. Um, I posted all these links in my notes, and now that I'm clicking on them, it's only allowing me to type. So I'm just gonna. I know the notes app is frustrating like that. Um, the first thing that I Wikipedia this week was the 
immortal jellyfish. Have you ever heard of that? Nope. Now I have to type it in and go find the article. So I I did Wikipedia it, but some of these are actual articles because they're a little more interesting to read or you, like better for us to understand. What? Can you give us just a sentence backstory of as to why you did Wikipedia it? Like yeah, I was what? watching Ancient Aliens. Oh, okay. So that's fine. I was just... Do you need to know why my thoughts get to where they get to? I would in general like to know that. Well, sometimes you can't. Okay. So... The immortal jelly, I have never heard of this before, even though I have watched this episode of Ancient uh-huh. Aliens, yeah. but they, uh, scientists discovered a jelly, jellyfish that can theoretically live forever. It's called a Turritopsis, sorry, Dorney. It's now officially known as the only immortal creature. The secret to eternal life, as it turns out, is not just living a really, really long time. It's about maturity or rather the lack of it. The immortal jellyfish, as it's better known popularly, propagate and then, faced with the normal career path of dying, they opt instead to revert to a sexually immature stage. Turns out that once the adult form of the 4.5 millimeter wide species have reproduced, they don't die, but transform themselves back into their juvenile polyp state. Their tentacles retract, their bodies shrink, and they sink to the ocean floor and start the cycle all over what again. What the fuck? Among laboratory samples, all the adult teropsis observed regularly undergo this change, and not just once. They can do it over and over again. Thus, the only known way they can die is that they get consumed by another fish or if a disease strikes the jelly. However, there are still many mysteries surrounding the teropsis dornai uh, to... Um, while the process of reverting from its adult phase to a polyp was observed several times, it hasn't been obser- observed yet in nature, only in laboratory environments. So it's the Benjamin Button jellyfish. Yeah. It just reverts to being young again. Yeah. And then it starts over. Like it's yeah. a video game. Yeah. That's so crazy. Does it shed part of its body or something? It just said that its tentacles retract into its body and it turns <sighs> itself into a polyp again. That's so efficient. Wow, good for them. But it has reproduced, so it made other jellyfish. No, that's like literally living a full life, having a family, about to die at 100, and you're like, I'm a baby. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Let's do it again. (laughs) But now, like, imagine in your, okay, this is totally made up. You have a little fish tank filled with immortal jellyfish. You start with one. Yeah. It's reproduced, and then all of a sudden it sinks to the bottom and it's a little polyp, but you have like four now. But how do you tell what the babies are and what the the Benjamin Button one is? You got to keep track of it. (laughs) (laughs) You got to teach them their name. Yeah, you got to teach them his name so you can keep track of which one's which. Okay, that's fucking interesting. Isn't it? That's cool. I want to be him. You want to be him? Yeah. But like there's no other species that we're aware of on earth that can revert back to a sexually immature stage and start its life cycle yeah, over like again. With, or without like dividing itself into a, a part of itself becomes a part of a new being like or an something. amoeba or something yeah yeah but don't they die eventually i think well i think parts of them do but i think parts of them move on or something i don't know i'm not a mathematician but i don't think they revert to a sexually immature stage like that's a really intense yeah. process yeah how do you do that? I don't know. Jellyfish be wildin'. Anyways. When you a jellyfish, but you also Benjamin Button. I just think it's just really interesting. Like how how do you even I wonder why what they do you do, do that? with that information? But like why? How can you figure out how they do that? How but why? How but why? That's what why? I'm saying. Why? 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 Okay, so this next thing okay. that I wikipedia but it's more like f- uh, fan wikipedia whatever the fandom. I literally was playing... Fickipedia. Yeah, fic- whatever. I was playing Elder Scrolls. Uh, you play Elder Scrolls? Hey, you know... I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Cut. I was playing Elder Scrolls yep. with a friend of mine who's mm. in one of my guilds, and she was telling me how she's super into My Little Pony, which I've heard some people are. I just had no idea how popular it was. And I've heard that it's all like the people that, I don't know what they call themselves. I'm sorry if I'm being ignorant, but they love My Little Pony so much because it's about magic and friendship. Have you heard that before? Not until you told me it. 
they love it. Okay. And adults. Y- yes. Yeah. The, they love the show, the books. Okay. And that it's so big that there is something called, uh, well, there's a lot of like fan fictions, like independently written stories about the My Little Pony universe in different whatever. This this one particular one is called Fallout Equestria. Like the game Fallout. Equestria? Equestria with My Little Pony so like, characters. Y- so all of the individual fan fictions usually focus on one of the ponies, which teaches you one specific thing about okay. life. Yeah. So like one of them is about this pony and her journey while she learns her purpose in life yeah. is to sacrifice herself for all of her friends at all costs. Whereas another one might be about persistence. And one of the ponies has to learn that her job in life is to just be persistent at all costs. So my friend was telling me how she loves this series called Follow Equestria. Mm. And I was like, what is that? Like a book? Like, what? what is that? She's like, it's an independently written fan fiction. But listen to this. Fallout Equestria is a crossover fan fiction between My Little Pony, <coughs> Friendship is Magic, television series, and the Fallout video game series, which was written by KCAT. Because I was like, who the hell is the author? Who is writing these fan fictions? Yeah. This person's name is KCAT. First published in April 2011 and completed on Christmas of that year, Fallout Equestria spans 45 chapters, as well as a prologue, introduction, epilogue, and afterward, and contains over 620 thousand words making fallout equestria one of the longest self-published works of derivative fiction in existence that's insane that is so insane that amount of words and then she was telling me there's another one that has over a million words so i was like you know i'm getting my mind blown a little bit like this is a fan fiction yeah. that is six hundred and twenty thousand words long so i was like that's crazy i've I don't even really remember the last time that I read like a book that was that long or anything like that, that that was that long. You know, I don't, I'm honestly, I don't think I ever have. And she was like, I don't really read them. I listen to them on YouTube. And I was like, I got to check this out. There's literal YouTube channels Mm -hmm. that are devoted to reading the fan fiction and their posts are like three hours long and it'll do like three chapters. That is an entire world I had no idea about. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, wow. The largest derivative fan fiction series that exists is Fallout Equestria, Whoa, or one of the, the largest. Heck, dude, that's crazy. Fallout Equestria. And I was like, did you ever play Fallout? And she was like, yeah. But I'm like, it's not. that's not the important part. It's the pony part. It's the like. Yeah, Fallout's more like the world it's in or whatever. Yeah. yeah. That's so funny. Right? Yeah. So I Googled what that was. Or I guess Wikipedia, what that was. But like, look at all these chapters. Like, it's just, it goes on and on and on and on and on. That is insane. Wow. I just, I had that no is idea. so many chapters. I, I know. I had, and this is just one of them. There's so many other ones. Yeah. But I had no idea that people wrote fan fictions from like TV series yeah. that were anywhere near this long yeah. or had this type of following. Yeah, that's nuts. Yeah. That's just dedication. I mean, there's that level of like interest in a in a world, a fictitious world that people want to make derivative content that's so intense. Yeah, I mean, for those of you that are having like a, even a hard time understanding what that is, it's like if you liked Game of Thrones, if somebody wrote a million word fan fiction about Game of Thrones in a Minecraft background. Yeah. That's the equivalent. Yeah. That's that's insane. That's so wild. Right? Yeah. <laughs> I had no idea. Yeah. I had no idea it was a thing. Anyways, I got my mind blown when she told me that. All right. The next thing <clears throat> that I wikipedia from watching Ancient Aliens was the Akashic Records. Have you ever heard of that? Nope. All right. I'll read this directly from Wikipedia. Hit me. I don't know how to say this word. In theosophy? Is that a word? Theosophy. Sounds right. Theosophy. Sound, you sound smart. Theosophy. <laughs> <laughs> and anthro, anthroposophy? You know what? Okay. The Akashic Records are a compendium of all human events, thoughts, words, emotions, and intent ever to have occurred in the past, present, or future. They are believed to be encoded in a non-physical plane of existence called the etheric plane. There are anecdotal accounts, 
but there is no scientific evidence for the existence of the Akashic records. What the heck? What? what? So it doesn't exist on a physical plane? What does that even mean? Yeah, so, well, I had to look it up on Wikipedia, even though there's more questions than answers yeah. when you look on Wikipedia. But in Ancient Aliens, basically, what they described it as is a record of everything that's ever existed, all of your memories, all of my memories, all of everyone's memories of everything that's ever existed, all of their thoughts, oh, oh, oh. all of their intents, oh, all my of God. everything. It, it's we're, we're all connected to a cosmic consciousness that is the collection of all of our consciousnesses put together. So like everything that you're living goes into this cosmic <sighs> consciousness and that there are people that have tapped into the Akashic records oh my by God. like meditating or, you know, existing in an, what do they call it? Um, etheric plane that you can actually access it at some point if you're like, I don't know, who's the person that we got that can get there? Damn. Deepak Chopra? I don't know. Who, who can get there? Someone's got to be super fucking outside of themselves to get there right you have to yeah. like elevate yourself yeah but that Holy i didn't know that there was shit. a word or like a it's like the library of humanity mm -hmm. that exists on a non-human plane of existence mm -hmm. what what size server do you think it is huge how many terabytes amazingly large billions of terabytes mm -hmm. literally i mean imagine dude every thought that everyone has ever had mm -hmm. how do you even organize that how do you tap into that? Well, think about how big the universe is. Well, here's my Maybe question. Maybe the Akashic record isn't even just human existence, like all beings of everywhere, in of every everything, universe. in every universe. What, what, if, what if, like, uh, what if you are just you're meditating one day, and you're just getting there. You're out there, right? You're like really <laughs> le le like levitating your mind to a different place because mm -hmm. you're meditating so dope. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And you start to Can get, relate. and you start <laughs> calm, get the calm app. <laughs> um, and you start to hear or see or like experience thoughts. And like, how do you know that that's where you are, that you're at the Ak Akashic records and you're not just like experiencing random thoughts that are in the universe? I feel like if you are anywhere close to experiencing the Akashic records, you don't have questions so, like <laughs> what you just asked. Fair enough. They just know. You're like, oh my God, what are these thoughts? No, you've already surpassed that many. Well, many, many I feel times like it's over. one of those things that if you once you get there, if you're if you're the person that can even reach that, you already know where you are. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. So, in the Wikipedia, is there any documentation of someone who claims to have reached it and will like well, claim yeah, that I, and talk about? Not it? in the Wiki. Mm. That's fucking uh, crazy, dude. Speaking of meditation, can I? Go for it, Julian. Download the Calm app today. <laughs> it is a great app. It helps with guided meditation, mindfulness, sleep. Uh, it has something called the Daily Calm, right? So you open up the Calm app on your phone. It's really great. You just pop it open, okay? And you press Daily Calm. And you pop in your AirPods or your earphones, your wireless, whatever, whatever you listen. Or you just play it through your iPhone speaker or whatever it is. And it walks you through a mindfulness routine where you really are able to, at least for me, center yourself, become aware of your thoughts, uh, and just kind of separate your mind from all of what's going on in your life, whether it's work or relationships or what's on your phone or what you have to do today or responsibilities or stresses. For the, the 10 minutes, you really... And this is just the Daily Calm. It's just one of the things they offer. They have a whole library of different activities. Um, 60 million people use them. But anyway, for that, those 10 minutes, for me at least, I'm able to really just hone in on my brain and like my thoughts. And for me, that's so powerful uh, because I feel like I could go so many days and weeks um, and moments without being mindful and it catches up and I start to feel a little bit crazy and I feel like I'm kind of losing you know, myself in ways um, of just becoming more aware of what's going on in my head. And so with the Calm app, it is a really great experience. And right now, you guys can get 40% off the Calm Premium subscription when you go to calm.com, C-A-L-M.com slash Jenna Julian. 
I would highly recommend it. You can also try the free trial or the free version when you just download the Calm app. Uh, give it a shot. Let us know what you think. Highly, highly recommend. And also, guys, the Skim, it is an amazing daily newsletter that you can sign up for. And in five minutes, you can skim the most important news of the day. Good news, bad news, whatever it is, they give you the, the bullet points of what's going on in the world that you are better off knowing. So right now, go to T-H-E-S-K-I-M-M, that's two M's, dot com slash Jenna Julian, or click the link in the description. Enter your email and click subscribe, and then you're done. It's completely free. And all you have to do is open the skim uh, in your email when it comes in in the morning, grab a cup of coffee, and educate yourself. It's all it is. It's very easy to read, easy to digest. It's not uh, convoluted with other things and opinions and this and that. It just gives you what you need. Um, so check it out. And also when you subscribe to the Skim newsletter, you are now entered to win a $250 Visa gift card, which you can spend wherever you want. Thank you, sponsors. Thank you, sponsors. Anyway, the reading. Akashic Record, that is intriguing to me. Mm-hmm. That reminds me of like, you ever watch Interstellar? Yeah, watched it with you. Oh, I, I don't remember if I watched it with you. But um, do you remember when, spoilers, cut, when they're, he's like traveling through like space and time, right? And he gets to that like, what is it? It's like inside the closet or something. Do you know what, I'm, what scene I'm referring to? Mm-hmm. And he's like, there's all these different dimensions around him. Mm -hmm. That's what I picture the Akashic Records. That's like what's popped into my brain when you described it. Well, yeah. And I mean, according to some of this too, it's like not just what has happened in the past, but what is going to happen in the future. And that that makes sense, yeah. Some of them aren't entirely clear. It's sort of like a a shifting synergy of what could happen. Got it. Like you're tapping into like a radio frequency of just a a library of things. Yeah, but then, I mean, I'm reading very confusing stuff because I think it's a confusing topic, you know, because no one knows so it's all just what anyone thinks so there i see a lot of language that is like how do you access your akashic records which would be like all of your lifetimes and all of your thoughts and all of your intents Uh and that implies i guess that your soul has lived before and that will live again so you're accessing something that that is personalized to you do you know what i mean whereas i think the the definition of it is like a cosmic total totality of everyone's consciousness for sure even animals and yeah anything sentient yeah but the the the, the, the base idea is that everyone sort of has their own every being would have one no i think it's just a a thought maybe people have an individual akashic record and that there's a bigger i don't know yeah why do you know why it has that name um i mean i can i was just wondering no it's not a big deal i was curious where it came from but that's super fucking interesting yeah it's it's a Sanskrit word for ether, sky, or atmosphere. That's pretty cool. Um, okay, next thing. Solar panels on the moon. Don't look down and look disinterested. It's a good time. Are you ready? Yeah. Did you get this information, aliens, too? Yeah. Okay. You know it. You know, when I see something in ancient aliens and you know, they'll just like glaze over it. And I'm like, I want to actually read a little more about that. I'll just go Google it. It's what, it's what a phone is for. Exactly. So this, this comes from the NASA website or something that looks like the NASA website. <laughs> NASA dot <gov>. <laughs> No, it is dot gov. So it is, is it? Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. This is the Luna ring concept. The Luna ring, electric power generated by a belt of solar cells around the lunar equator could be transmitted and beamed to the Earth from the near side of the moon. Fuck. Yeah, so this was a real thing that I think it was uh, a Japanese uh, construction company was seriously considering. Well, I'll I'll read this and I'll tell you what I know. The (laughs) The Shimizu Corporation, a Japanese construction firm, has recently proposed, and I don't know what year this was published, uh, but recently, whenever this was published... Um, a plan to harness solar energy on a larger scale than almost any previously proposed concept. Their ambiguous plan involves building a belt of solar cells around the moon's 6,800 mile or 11,000 kilometer equator, converting the electricity to powerful microwaves and lasers to be beamed to 
at Earth, and finally, converting the beams back to electricity or terrestrial power stations, or at terrestrial power stations. The lunar ring concept, the company says, could meet the entire world's energy needs. Holy shit. Robots would play the primary role in building the lunar ring. Teleoperated 24 hours a day (sighs) from the Earth, the robots would be teleoperated from Earth to level the lunar landscape and assemble machines and equipment in orbit before they are landed on the moon. A team of astronauts would support the robots on site. Due to the massive amount of solar panels and other materials needed for the project, lunar resources would be used to the fullest extent possible. Water could be produced near the equator by reducing lunar soil with hydrogen imported from Earth. Lunar resources could also be used to make cementing material and concrete while solar heat treatments could help produce bricks, glass fibers, and structural materials needed for the project. The lunar ring itself would initially have a width of a few kilometers, but could be extended up to 400 kilometers wide. The electric power generated by solar cells would be transmitted by electric cables to transmission facilities on the near side of the moon, while, which is constantly facing Earth. After the electricity is converted into microwave beams and laser beams, 20 kilometer diameter antennas would beam the power to receivers on Earth. A guidance radio beacon would ensure accurate transmission to receivers. I'm just trying to read if this is like actually viable or not, or if they're actually moving forward with it or whatever. Oh. Yeah, whatever. Okay, so, but the idea is we are dealing with some energy issues. Yeah. Some renewable resource issues, mm-hmm. some climate issues. Yeah. This basically is proposing a way to beam unlimited clean energy down to Earth from the moon because the moon is always getting sunlight and a lot brighter and a lot better sunlight than the Earth gets because they have no atmosphere. Oh. And just beaming it down to us. That was my question. Is like, why do they have better... That's fucking crazy, dude. Thinking about the thinking about remote operating robots from Earth to Moon mm-hmm. that is responsible. Ima- okay, so imagine they build this thing, right? And in like 150 years, the Earth is now run 100% off of energy from the Moon diffracted, refracted from the Sun, right? And so there's an issue. Imagine being the tech support guy who's responsible for programming the robot to fix whatever issue is and all that the only thing that depends on it is all of earth's energy <laughs> like that is so insane to me mm-hmm. it's so cool to think about though right like and it would just beam the energy over and well, like so you said you mentioned something about converting the energy back to like usable electricity electricity right that's fucking crazy well, so you dude. think about how many people have solar panels like california mm-hmm. is a state that will give you what a tax deductions tax deductions if you are using a house that has solar panels that yep. kind of stuff so they're mm-hmm. incentivizing people to yep. use solar panels but the problem with solar panels is even in california which is a very sunny place yep. you still have cloudy days you still have nighttime you know you still have times when your solar panel isn't getting you any power if you put it in a place where there it's getting constant light literally all the time all the time that's fucking wild you could have enough power in theory to power the entire world you know where i see that being more realistic in like a in a like if i if i could imagine reading something about this in the future that actually happens is not a way for the entire world to get their energy from the moon but rather like a premium energy subscription that only super fucking rich people could afford the energy off like a handful of solar panels on the moon or the ones that were in outer space, right? That's terrible. Isn't that scary though? But that's that's something I could imagine, right? Like they figure out- Corporatizing Well, it. corporatizing it, but also like they couldn't quite scale it right away to like serve the whole world. So only the elite can afford it or something, right? That's and terrifying. there's only X amount of them. And so then like- Yes, like all everyone who is struggling with their, the energy crisis uh, on Earth has to worry about that, except for like the super fucking rich people who are getting it from the moon. Yeah. Imagine that. That's mm-hmm. fucking crazy. That's super interesting though. Right? So the belt of panels, right? The one that you described on the moon, that would go around the entire moon, like as like a ring kind of. Mm-hmm. And so every every single second, there's some energy being absorbed. Mm-hmm. That's so cool. 
Imagine what the moon would look like with that thing on it. It would have a fancy belt. <laughs> it would look so cute. So cute. It would look so cute at night with its little belt. That is just like tripping me out to think about. It. Right? Yeah. Damn. Anyways, I thought that was really cool. I like that one. And I mean, I don't know how viable it is or how much they're doing that seriously, but I do know that that's a theory that exists, which I think is a really cool theory. Like what a brilliant thought, isn't it? Brilliant thought. And then here I am just sitting on this butt. I'm sitting on this butt. And I'm like, what am I contributing to humanity except a giant fucking never ending distraction? You're welcome. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, I seriously like keep myself up at night sometimes. I'm like, am I just contributing to the culture of distraction of a terrible person? <laughs> okay. The next thing that I okay. that I Wikipedia mm -hmm. were Japanese water demons. Oh. Called Kappa. This Kappa? is directly from Wikipedia. A Kappa or river child, also known as Kawataro, Kamahiki. Mm. Oh, Kawataro is river boy. Kamahiki is horse puller. Kawatora is river tiger. And Suiko, or water tiger, is an amphibious yokai demon or imp found in traditional... Imp! In traditional... <laughs> I like imps. There's a lot of imps in the Elder Scrolls. Found in traditional... Ja now you know how it feels when you make Tarkov jokes. Found in traditional Japanese folklore. They are typically depicted as green, human-like beings with webbed hands and feet. Green and is horse. And a turtle-like shell on their backs. All right, here's the most interesting okay, part. Are you ready? Yeah, hit a, me. A depression on its head called its dish, or sara, retains water. And if this is damaged or its liquid is lost, either through spilling or drying up, the kappa is severely weakened. Okay, so it's pretty much a water bowl. It's a water bowl. So to defeat it, you, you say, Peachy, you thirsty? <laughs> it goes up and <gasps> drinks the water out Toxic. of it. Toxic. The demon water bowl. Oh, my God. All right. Why is it called a demon, though? Or why is it a... It will listen. Okay, sorry. The kappa are known to favor cucumbers. Yum and cute. And love to engage in sumo wrestling. <laughs> fun what the heck? they are often accused of assaulting humans in water and removing a mythical organ called the all right i'm trying really hard shiri kodama from their victim's anus oh so it goes to the butt mm -hmm. what is a mythical organ <laughs> They're, I guess they're telling, I've, I, well, on Ancient Aliens, which is where I saw them, they speak even though they have like a beak and they, the people used to tell their kids to stay away from water because there's kappa in them and that they're like, I'm, all right, I'm going to take your shiri kodama from you now and from then they, butt. and then they do butt stuff butt and then stuff. you're like, oh my God, <laughs> oh, I don't want to go swimming anymore. <laughs> they did butt stuff. Um, this Hi is, doctor, my... You know, my mythical organ, it really hurts. Do you have any medicine for that? Appearance. <laughs> I just think that's so funny, the word mythical organ. The kappa is said to be roughly humanoid in form and about the size of a child, inhabiting the ponds and rivers of Japan. It's typically greenish in color or yellow-blue and either scaly or slimy-skinned with webbed hands and feet and a turtle-like shell on its back. One particular trait is that it has a cavity on its head uh, it retains water or some sort of liquid, mm -hmm. which is regarded as the source of the kappa's power or life force. This cavity must be full whenever a kappa is away from the water. If it ever dries out or the water is spilled, kappa loses its power and may even die. The kappa are sometimes sell said to smell like fish, and they can swim like them. According to some accounts, its arms are connected to each other through the torso and can slide from one side to the other. So the arms can just like spin around. Well, they are primarily water creatures. They do on occasion venture onto land. When they do, the dish on their head can be covered with a metal cap for protection. A metal cap? A metal cap. Behavior. Kappa are usually seen as mischievous troublemakers or trickster figures. Yeah, they They're, don't sound straight up at all. Mm -mm, they sound shifty. They sound shifty. 
Their actions range from comparatively minor, such as looking up women's kimonos. Mm-mm. No, no, no. To the outright malevolent, such as drowning people or animals, kidnapping children, raping women, and at times eating human flesh. Oh. Though sometimes menacing, it may also behave amicably towards humans. Thank you, Peach. Why? All right, here's a whole section on cucumber. Folk beliefs claim the cucumber as their traditional favorite meal. At festivals, offerings of cucumber are frequently made to the kappa. Sometimes the kappa is said to have other favorite foods, such as the Japanese eggplant, soba, uh, fermented soybeans, and Sushi. kabocha. In uh, Edo, old Tokyo, there used to be a tradition where people would write the names of their family members on cucumbers and send them afloat into the streams to mollify the kappa to prevent the family from coming into harm in the streams. Oh, in wow. some regions, it was customary to eat cucumbers before swimming as protection, but in others, it was believed that this act would guarantee an attack. Yeah, wouldn't that make you smell and taste like cucumber so they would want you? Well, this is cool. Listen to this. A cucumber-filled sushi roll is known as a kapamaki. Oh, my God. I think I've actually seen that name on menus. There you go. Because the tuna roll is tekamaki. Mm. Oh, yum. Fun. As water monsters, kappa have been blamed for drownings and are often said to try to lure people into water and pull them in with their great skill at wrestling. Damn, they wrestle? They, they wrestle. They sumo wrestle. They are sometimes said to take their victims for the purposes of drinking their blood, eating their livers, or gaining powers by taking their shiri, shiriko dama, a mythical ball said to contain the soul, which is located inside the anus. <laughs> please tell me. Please tell me. <laughs> oh no oh no i'm so scared please don't take my shoe kodama <laughs> kappa have been used to warn children of the dangers of lurking in rivers and lakes as kappa have been often said to try to lure people to water to pull them in even today, signs warning about kappa appear by bodies of water in some Japanese towns and villages. Like, there's literally a picture of a child getting pulled under. That's, Imagine, like, what, visiting, though, that? with your kids and being like, what the fuck is going on in this lake? So, I was wondering what it looked like. This drawing of it makes it look like a fish person. No, no, there's other pictures. You can you can Wikipedia in your own How time big are they? How see. big are they? Did you I say that? I already said that. I know, I forget. How big are they? Like, child size. Oh, okay. Almost. Kappa are also said to victimize Fuck a animals, kappa up, dude. especially horses and cows. The motif of the kappa trying to drown a horse is found all over Japan. Um, ba -ba 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 -ba. Oh, defeating the kappa. Okay, here's a picture that you can look at of the butt stuff with the soul taking. Oh! Yeah, there you go. It was believed that there were a few means of escape if one was confronted with a kappa. Kappa are obsessed with politeness. So if a person makes a deep bow, it will return the gesture. This results in the kappa spilling the water held in the dish on its head, rendering it unable to leave the bowing position until the plate is refilled with water from the river in which it lives. If a person refills it, the kappa will serve that person for all eternity. A similar weakness of the kappa involves its arms, which can easily be pulled from its body. If an arm is detached, the kappa will perform favors or share knowledge in exchange for its return. Tell me your secrets, kappa. Another method to defeat, uh, of defeat involves shogi or sumo wrestling. A kappa sometimes challenges a human being a human being to wrestle or engage in other tests of skill. Here you go, Julian. This tendency is easily used to encourage the kappa to spill the water from its sara. One notable example of this method is the folktale of a pharma who, farmer who promised his daughter's hand in marriage to a kappa in return for the creature irrigating his, his land. The what the heck kind of dad is that? The farmer's daughter challenges the kappa to submerge several gourds in water when the kappa fails in its task it retreats saving the farmer's daughter from marriage kappa have also been driven away from their aversion to iron sesame or ginger Ooh, i like ginger 
All right, here's some good deeds. Kappa are not entirely antagonistic to human beings. Once befriended, Kappa may perform any number of tasks for human beings, such as helping farmers irrigate their land. Sometimes they bring fresh fish, which is regarded as a mark of good fortune for the family that receives it. They're also highly knowledgeable about medicine, and legend states that they are taught the art of bone setting to human beings. What I want to know is like, so they're underwater most of the time, right? But they can come out, but they're mm-hmm. underwater most of the time, right? Mm-hmm. How do you sumo wrestle underwater? And if you do sumo wrestle, well, you do it on land. Well, if you do it on land, you can't defeat them because they put the damn metal cap on the head, and they mm-hmm. can't. You can't pour the water out. Take the cap off. It's a metal cap. It's like a tank. Mm-hmm. That's super crazy. I didn't. It seems to be very like widely. I don't know, like known. In Japanese culture, because of Listen what you're shown. In Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 3, Leonardo, Michelangelo, Donatello, and Raphael are mistaken for Kappa when they are teleported back in time to feudal Japan. No way. Is that real? It's real in a movie. Yeah, but that movie's a documentary, I thought. Oh, yeah, it's a documentary. Yeah. Okay. Are you ready for the last one? Yeah, yeah. Hit me, hit me, hit me, hit me. Which hit me. really sent me on a fun trip. Okay. So your girl was looking at... Nikola Tesla's personal life on Wikipedia. Okay. Boy, is it a good time. You want to you wanna hear a portrait of a man? I give you a portrait of a man. Personal life. Tesla was six feet tall, two inches. Weighed 142 pounds. With almost no weight variance from 1888 to about 1926. His appearance was described by newspaper editor Arthur Brisbane as almost the tallest, almost the thinnest, and certainly the most serious man who goes to Delmonico's regularly. He was an elegant, stylish figure, stylish figure in New York City, meticulous in his grooming, clothing, and regimented in his daily activities. An appearance he maintained as to further his business relationship. He was also described as having light hand or light eyes, very big hands, and remarkably big thumbs. Tesla read many works, memorizing complete books, and supposedly possessed a photographic memory. He was a polygot, speaking eight languages, Serbo-Croatian, Czech, English, French, German, Hungarian, Italian, and Latin. Fuck. Tesla related his autobiography, related in his autobiography that he experienced detailed moments of inspiration. During his early life, Tesla was repeatedly stricken with illness. Uh, I remember all of that, but that's not the good part. I'm getting to the good part. He has picture thinking. Blah, 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 blah. Picture thinking. Picture thinking. Relationships. Tesla never married, explaining that his chastity was very helpful to his scientific abilities. He once said in his earlier years that he felt he could never be worthy enough for a woman, considering women superior in every way. True. Okay, I'm on board. Ready? I'm on on board. Tesla. Preach. With you. His opinion had started to sway in later years when he felt that women were trying to outdo men and make themselves more dominant. This, quote, new woman was met with much indignation from Tesla, who felt that women were losing their femininity by trying to be in power. In an interview, the Galveston Daily News on uh, August 10, 1924, he stated, In place of the soft-voiced, gentle woman of my reverent worship has come the woman who thinks that her chief success in life lies in making herself as much possible like man, in dress, voice, and actions, in sports achievements of every kind. The tendency of women to push aside men, supplanting the old spirit of cooperation with him in all their affairs of life, is very disappointing to me. Although he told a reporter in later years that he sometimes felt that by not marrying, he had not made... He had made too great a sacrifice to his work. Tesla chose to never pursue or engage in any known relationships, instead finding all the stimulation he needed in his work. Tesla was antisocial and prone to seclude himself with his work. However, when he did engage in social life, many people spoke positively and admiringly of Tesla. Um, Robert Underwood Johnson described him as distinguished, with a sweetness, sincerity, modesty, refinement, generosity, and force. I'm trying to get to the good part. Some good, there's some good stuff in here. Just give me a second. Hit me with it, baby. It's a good time. When you stimulated by your job. Tesla could be harsh at times and openly express disgust for overweight people, such as when he fired a secretary because of her weight. He was quick to criticize clothing on several occasions. Tesla directed a subordinate to go home and change her dress. 
when Thomas Edison died in 1931, Tesla contributed the only negative opinion to the New York Times, buried in an extensive coverage of Edison's life. This is what he wrote. He had no hobby, cared for no sort of amusement of any kind, and lived in utter disregard of the most elementary rules of hygiene. His method was, was inefficient in the extreme, for an immense ground had to be covered to get anything at all unless blind chance intervened. And at first, I was almost a sorry witness of his doings, knowing that just a little theory and calculation would have saved him 90% of the labor. Oh my God. But he had a variable, veritable contempt for book learning and mathematical knowledge, trusting himself entirely to his inventor's instinct and practical American sense. Toxic. Right? Oh my God. His sleep habits. Tesla claimed to never sleep more than two hours per night. (laughs) However, he did admit to, quote, dozing from time to time to, quote, recharge his batteries. During his second year of study at Graz, Tesla developed a passionate proficiency for billiards, chess, and card playing, sometimes spending more than 48 hours in a stretch at a gaming table. My guy was the gamer. You know what I'm saying? (laughs) On one occasion at his laboratory, Tesla worked for a period of 84 hours without rest. Kenneth Swayze, a journalist with whom Tesla had befriended, confirmed that Tesla rarely slept. He recalled one morning Tesla called him at 3 a.m. I was sleeping in my room like one dead. Suddenly, the telephone rang and awakened me. Uh, He was just he never sleeps. Um, He worked every day from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. or later with dinner exactly at 8, 10 p.m. at Delmonico's restaurant and later the Waldorf Astoria Hotel. Tesla would telephone his dinner order to the head waiter, who would also be the only one to serve him. The meal was required to be ready at 8 o'clock. He dined alone, except on the rare occasion when he would give uh, a dinner to a group to meet his social obligations. What? Tesla would then resume his work off until 3 a.m. For exercise, Tesla walked between 8 and 10 miles a day. What? When? He curled his toes 100 times for each (laughs) foot each night, saying that it stimulated his brain cells. Toe curls. Toe curls. What the heck? (laughs) Toe curls. Toe curls for the girls. Them girls like them strong toes. He was a gamer. He loved women until he hated women. Yeah. Never was with one. I want to try toe curls because if that stimulates his brain, it'll probably work, right? Yeah, but so does never sleeping. And there's a whole <laughs> part about him getting really sick a lot. Yeah. Which probably has to do with the fact that he's never fucking sleeping or like doing anything. Hold on. Other than walking and eating at Delmonico's at 8 p.m. Julian, no. I just curled my toe. And he was he like low-key dick, huh? Yeah, high key dick. High key he put, dick. He put in in the the Thomas Edison thing. Oh my god, horrible! Keep That's that so shit rude. To yourself, like, man. Why? it's unnecessary. What's going on with you, my guy? My guy. My guy. <laughs> just take a nap, my guy. My guy. He's dead, dude. Just let He's it go. Dead. Just t- like take a nap for a week or two. My guy. If you ain't got nothing nice to say about <laughs> Thomas Edison, consider just saying nothing at all. My, my guy. guy. My guy. <laughs> yeah, he was a gamer, but. He was toxic. He was a toxic gamer. He was a toxic, non-sleeping gamer <laughs> that had no time for women except to tell him to go home and change the fucking dress, curling his toes, walking 10 miles a day. Only one person can serve him at Delmonico's. That's so wild. Right? Yeah. That was a real, that was a real person Six how he two, lived. 142 pounds. How do you live like that, dude? He was just very busy. I, don't I mean, we're all grateful to all of the things that he's contributed to us, though. So. I mean, you live your life however you got to live it in order to get all those thoughts uh, out. It's pretty great stuff. Yeah. But like, man, we're not going to forget what you did. My you guy. Did, you did my guy Tom real toxic, dirty. He was the first toxic gamer. <laughs> the t- <laughs> he was the first ever toxic gamer. That's who he is. you toxic, yeah. dude. Fucking terrible. That's so crazy and interesting. Like what to think about right? that is wild. I just like reading stuff like that because I'm like, wow. All right, sick. I should start Wikipediaing things because I was genuinely interested in everything you brought up. Thank like, you. I well, thank you. But I mean, th- I was more like it's just interesting. Why do you think I sit around and look stuff up all the time? I don't Why know. do you think my brain is filled with the worst, stupidest, dumbest information ever? 
I just can't I mean, stop. There's a lot of room. You gotta fill it, it with something. There. I gotta. Keep, I keep jamming dumb stuff in there. I can't stop. Sometimes I just leave it empty. Oh, okay, tight. So that when I yell, I can just hear myself really loud. Oh, sick. Um, no, it was really fun. We had another segment, but we'll do it another episode. Yeah. For me, but um, no, that was really cool. I love the idea of just getting lost in Wikipedia. That's holes. what I do. That's cool. The what is it? The uh, the library one, the Akasha, what is Akashic Records. Akashic Records. That one is fucking crazy. Mm-hmm. That one's one that's going to keep me up at night. I'm going to like actually be thinking about that when I'm trying to fall asleep. Cool. It's going to be hard to fall asleep. I already have a hard time falling asleep. Well, not falling asleep, staying asleep, but calm. Anyway, guys, uh, thank you for another year of really great podcasts. We, uh, we appreciate you guys more than we could ever say. For real. For real. Thank you for supporting the podcast like you have for so long. And it's crazy that we're moving on to 2020. I, can't, I honestly can't believe it. Like you, I can't believe it either. Can't believe it for a lot of reasons. What but year is it? Where am I? What am I doing? What are we fucking doing out here, dude? Uh, I really, really hope you guys all have a wonderful holiday and some time off. Spend it with the people you love. And uh, we'll see you guys in January for a fresh, bright, new year full of content um but yeah just a big thank you to you guys for supporting thank you guys so happy holidays we love you we'll see you in two weeks we'll see you in two weeks happy new year happy new year bye guys